This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. September 27th. We were working the day watch out of burglary auto theft division. The boss is Captain Green. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. It was 1.15 p.m. During our lunch break, Bill had bought himself a puzzle. He said he knew it would relax him. What's the matter? Are you giving up? Oh, that thing's infuriating. I wouldn't be surprised if it's impossible to work. I think they made these holes too small. What's the idea? How's it go? Well, it looks simple enough. The idea is to get these four little ball bearings into these four very little small holes. Simple as pie. Well, maybe all it takes is a steady hand. My hand's steady enough, Joe. They just went and made those holes too small. There's two of them. And there's number three. You did? Whoops. Sure, whoops. That's the tough one, number four. There she goes. There's all four of them, first, second, third, and home. Must be the old nerves. They're all frayed. No, thanks. You keep it. Well, don't you want to beat it? You beat it, Joe. I'd rather think it was my shattered nerves. Burglary Friday. Yes, that's right. What's that address? I see. Well, what's missing? Oh. Yes, ma'am, I understand. All right, we'll be right out. Over on West Garfield, a woman had her entire house cleaned out. Yeah? A blind woman. Whoever did it even took her cane. 1.45 p.m. We left the office and drove over to 2358 West Garfield. You the police? Yes, ma'am, that's right. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Oh, it's terrible. I just can't believe it. I simply can't believe it. He didn't leave her a thing. Nothing. Can you believe it? He even took her cane. I got a stick. I got a stick. Now, this he you keep talking about, do you know who he is? My husband, Mr. Daniel Loomis. Loomis. He even cleaned out your kitchen, too, didn't he? Refrigerator, stove. Your husband's the devil incarnate. Yes, Grandma, I know, I know. The devil. Look under rocks, you'll find him. She's my grandmother, Mrs. Candell. Mr. Loomis came over to sit with her to keep her company. He's a snake. I always said so. I said so from the first time I met him. Soft, sweaty hands. Such a divine pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mrs. Candell. He even hissed like a snake. Look under rocks. I wonder if we could have a description. I'll give you a description. A forked tongue, little beady eyes, and he slithers on his belly. You'll find him easy. Just look under rocks. Yes, ma'am. You wanted a description? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Loomis is 38. He's six feet tall. He has sandy hair. His eyes... His eyes are brown. They're very sweet. Very soft. Yes, ma'am. Any marks or scars? Well, is, it, is a tattoo a mark? Yes, ma'am. Does he have one? On his right arm. Could you describe it? It's a heart with his name written inside it. His name? Yes, Mr. Daniel Loomis. You mean Daniel Loomis? No, Mr. Daniel Loomis. The word Mr. is tattooed on his arm? Everyone called him Mr. Daniel Loomis. He insisted on it. A matter of respect, he said. Even I had to call him Mr. Except, well, you know, when we were alone. Now, do you have any idea why he did this? My mother and my aunt generally keep Granny company, but today they had to go shopping downtown, so they asked Mr. Loomis to stay with her. He came over about nine this morning. Does he have a job? He's between jobs. It's going on a year now. Now, he left this morning, and that was the last you've seen of him. Is that right? I came over on my lunch hour. I work just a few blocks away. I'm a bookkeeper at Trundles. I found the house the way you saw it, cleaned out. 
Grandma was just standing in the corner when I came. With everything gone that way, she didn't know where to move. Blind people rely somewhat on reference points. When they're taken away, they're lost. She was just standing there in the corner crying. I found the box out back for her to sit on. He took everything, even the money she had hidden in her cookie jar. She'd saved about $30. He took the cookie jar, too. I see. Now, what else did he take? Nothing very valuable, if that's what you mean. Just everything she had. Pictures, keepsakes, mementos, things even a blind woman can see. I better be getting back to her. I know she's frightened. You'll let us know? Yes, ma'am. We'll be in touch with you. Thank you kindly. You know, Joe, women are funny. How's that? This creep Loomis pulls a stunt like this, and his wife describes his eyes as soft and sweet. Yeah, sounds like the grandmother's description's a little closer to the truth, doesn't it? Two twenty p.m. We return to Parker Center to run a check on Daniel Loomis. Aren't I's running a make on Loomis? Should call any minute. Friday, pick up two. Thanks. It's Friday. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Daniel Loomis. Right. Uh huh. What was the guy's name? Right. Thank you very much. Bad paper. Loomis skipped bail while he was waiting for trial about two years ago. Apparently, he uses that trademark all the time. What's that? He signed all the checks, mister. Is that right? And the man who put up his bond was a fellow by the name of Chester Albertson. He owns a bowling alley over on Western. Friend of his? Ex-friend, more than likely. When Loomis skipped out on his bail, he left Albertson holding the bag for the $5,000 bond. This guy's really beautiful, isn't he? Yeah. Like shaking hands with a violin spider. 3.15 p.m., we arrived at the Rollaway Alleys at 4211 Southwestern. You Chester Albertson? I'm 41 across. Oh, I'm Chester Albertson, right. Can I help you? We're police officers. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. It's got to do with Melchick, right? Listen, friend, I told that Melchick 20 times, no hustling. I told him, plain out, no gambling. Every time he comes around here, he's got another sucker on the string. Well, this last time was a hair that broke this camel's back. I tossed him out on his bar. I told him, I says, Melchick, I hate to do this, but if you think I'm going to take the chance of losing my license for a no-good-for-nothing bum like you, you're wrong. So I tossed him. I pay my rent, I pay my taxes, so that gives me a right, right? So what's his gripe? We're not here about that. It's Daniel Loomis we want to know about. You guaranteed his bail two years ago, isn't that right? Don't remind me. What a world. Milchick gives me heartburn, and Mr. Daniel Loomis gives me ulcers. Loomis was a friend of yours? Listen, friend, when a fox eats a chicken, do you go around asking if they were buddies? Friend, Loomis gobbled me up. Gizzard, feathers, the whole works. How well did you know Loomis? He was a regular. Used to come in and bowl three or four lines several nights a week. We used to have a couple of beers and jaw a while when he'd finished. Good bowler. He had this great hook. You'd think each time he was pitching a gutter ball, but at the last second it took this crazy twist and pow, right in the pocket. How long did you know him? A little over a year, I guess. Why'd you put up his bail? Like I say, he was a regular. Anyone can be bum-wrapped, and he was like a friend, and it seemed like the friendly thing to do. What do you know about him? Well, after I got him bailed out, he moved in with me, just to give him a chance to get back on his feet. He seemed like a right guy, not a slob like some of the clowns you meet these days. A nice, soft-spoken, educated kind of guy. He went to church regular. I don't go, you understand, but I kind of like other people to go. I think they get something out of it. But this Loomis creep, the only thing he ever got out of church was whatever he pinched from the collection tray. I mean, let's face it, he was strictly B.N. B.N.? Bad news. But how can you guess? Especially me, I'm a trusting guy. Spell that J-E-R-K. We agreed to go 50-50 on the apartment. In fact, he insisted. So I give Loomis cash, and he pays the rent, phone, and utility bills. How dumb can I be, right? The guy's up on a bum check wrap, and I'm paying him cash. Sure enough, all that paper comes bouncing back to my front door. By that time, Loomis has moved on. So is my camera, my stereo rig, my three good suits, my TV set. The crumb even heists my bowling trophies. What kind of work did Loomis do? You got me. I always figured him for some kind of salesman. He was a very nice talker, very smooth. He didn't talk so much about himself, though, mostly politics and sports, stuff like that. Do you ever talk about his wife? His ex, I guess you mean. His ex-wife? Yeah, Maxine. He mentioned her a couple times. When he got a few beers in him, he'd talk about moving back to Penley, Ohio and getting married up with Maxine again. But it was just beer talk. He never mentioned Penley or the Broad when he was sober. 
You know, when the liquor's in, the truth is out. You ever mention any other relatives? <laughs> yeah, a brother is. Name of Charlie. <laughs> he sure hated Charlie. He used to cuss him out with words I never even heard of. You know where this Charlie lives? Sure, Kingford, New Jersey. I even talked to Charlie. When Daniel took the powder, I called up Charlie on the phone. I thought maybe he'd want to do the right thing by me. You know, sometimes brothers feel responsible for each other, family reputation and so forth. What'd he say when you called him? Well, I introduced myself, Chester Albertson, and explained the circumstances. And friend, when I got all finished with my spiel, you'll never guess what he said. What did he say? First he laughed, only it wasn't exactly a laugh. And then he said, welcome to the club. Did he say anything else? Nope, then he hanged up. Can you beat that? Four ten p.m., we returned to Parker Center. I concluded a long-distance call to Charlie Loomis in Kingford, New Jersey. Bill called Maxine Loomis in Pinley, Ohio. This Daniel Loomis can't be real. The more I hear about him, the more I figure he's just a figment of someone's imagination. What'd you get from his ex-wife? For openers, it's not his ex-wife. As far as she knows, she's still Mrs. Mr. Daniel Loomis. One day, about three years ago, she came home, told him they were expecting a baby. Sometime during the night, he packed his bags, and she hasn't heard from him since. What's his brother have to say about him? Well, he hasn't seen Loomis since February 8th, 1964. Now, he remembers the date real well because that was the day after their mother died. It seems that Daniel ran away with the funeral funds. You know, after a while in this work, you think you've met them all. Yeah, you do. I've been on the job 19 years, Joe, and for sheer gall, I think this boy wins the prize. Burglary Friday. Right. Yes, ma'am, I see. When? What was that address? Right, I have it. Thank you. That was the second Mrs. Loomis. Yeah? In the mail today, she received her canceled checks from the bank. One of the checks was a deposit for an apartment over on West Cyprus. The check was signed... Mr. Daniel Loomis. Maybe we got a break. I was beginning to think the girl's grandmother was going to be right after all. How's that? I was about ready to start looking under rocks. <laughs> Four thirty-five p.m. We drove over to the Cypress Arms Apartments. Yes. We're police officers. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. I'm Amanda Tucker. What's wrong? Do you have a tenant here named Daniel Loomis? He paid his deposit, but he hasn't moved in yet. And if my prayers are answered, he'll never move in. Why do you say that? First, you tell me why you're looking for him. Routine investigation. Sure. Come on in. When my daughter gets home, maybe she can tell you what you want to know. Your daughter's a friend of his, is she? With Mr. Loomis as a friend, I suspect you don't need enemies. Yes, my daughter is a friend of Mr. Loomis's. A mother doesn't have enough to worry about without Mr. Loomis's popping up. When will your daughter be home? Oh, any minute now. I sure hope you're going to arrest Mr. Loomis. You sound like you don't like him very much. You could put it that way. The truth of the matter is I hate him. Why are you renting an apartment to him? The same reason I hate him. Because of Doris. Doris? My daughter. What's she have to do with it? They're engaged, her and Mr. Loomis. Oh, come on, tell me. What do you want him for? How many wives has he murdered for their insurance money? What makes you think that? Because he smells bad. How's that? I don't mean he needs a bath. A mother's nose. You know how a fish stinks when it's gone bad? Well, that's how Mr. Loomis smells to me. Do you have anything else besides that to go on? You gentlemen need more. I trust my nose. Why would he want to marry Doris? Ma'am? You tell me why Mr. Loomis, so suave, so sophisticated, so well-educated, wants to marry my Doris. I'm not sure we follow you. Listen, don't misunderstand. I want Doris to be happy. I want to see her married with a family of her own. I love her, but I'm her mother. Mothers love their children, but what does Mr. Loomis see in her? Please tell me that. I wouldn't know, ma'am. She's not pretty, she's plain. She's homely, homely and heavy. Mr. Loomis is no Prince Charming, but if all the boys in the neighborhood can do better than Doris, why not a hotshot like Loomis? She's not very bright. She can't cook. She doesn't like to keep house. She can't sew on a button even. When it comes to dancing, she's got two left feet. I love her, but what could a man see in Doris? I say nothing. When are they planning to get married? Next month. They've opened a joint honeymoon fund at the bank. They're supposed to take a trip to Hawaii. Hawaii. If you ask me, it's a waste of money. How do you mean? What's in Hawaii? They got pineapples. So is the supermarket. They got a beach. So has Santa Monica. Well, what else? The hula? The only way Doris could do the hula would be if she stood still and the earth shook. Either of you gentlemen single? He is. You'll like Doris. Oh, that must be her. 
Doris, meet Sergeant Friday and Officer Gannon. They're policemen. They've come to arrest your Mr. Loomis. What? Aren't you going to arrest him? We'd like to ask him some questions. Oh, that's what they always say when they're going to arrest someone. What do you want with him? He hasn't done anything. Now, don't get excited, Doris. You'd want to be guilty of shielding a dangerous criminal. These gentlemen are only doing their duty. What's this all about? Do you know where we can get in touch with Daniel Loomis? What if I do? Then we want you to tell us. What do you think he's done? Well, to start with, he's married. Twice. A bigamist. At least he doesn't murder them. Mother, I don't believe you. It's true, Miss Tucker. If you're a couple of Daniel's friends playing a joke, I want you to know that I don't think you're very funny. No, it's not a joke, Miss Tucker. I'm sorry. I suppose I should have guessed. Why should someone like Daniel want someone like me? But he did want me. He asked me to marry him. I met him three months ago at the County Art Museum, and just two weeks later he proposed. If he didn't love me, why would he ask me to be his wife? This joint honeymoon fund that you have at the bank, now tell us, was that his idea? Honeymoon? You don't mean he'd do all that to me just for... Oh, no! 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 Sometimes you're right about something, someone, and you'd give your eyes to be wrong. Poor Doris. A mother's nose. I wish I could sniff out happiness for her instead of all the time calamities and disappointments. It's like predicting the end of the world, and the next day it blows up. You can't take much satisfaction in being right. All right. All right. How can I help you? Can you tell us where we can find Loomis? He was supposed to take me to a movie tonight, but not until about 8 o'clock. He's probably bowling. He bowls over that place near Clayton, near the shopping center. Glass, I suppose. Is it glass? I'm no judge. Neither am I. Not of anything. And all this time, I've been thinking he was too good for her. I have to ask, what kind of mother does that make me? 5.20 p.m., we arrived at Anson's bowling lanes. We recognized Loomis from his description. You Daniel Loomis? I'm Mr. Daniel Loomis. Who are you? I'm Mr. Officer Gannon. This is Mr. Sergeant Friday. Police. That's right. Well, now, what do you want with me? Oh, Loomis, we hardly know where to begin. Burglary, forgery, bigamy. Oh, yeah, well, I can explain all that. You mind holding this? You're doing just fine. I'm bowling a three-game series. Got another game to go. No, you've got no more games to go. But I'm going for a 600 series. No, you're going downtown. You're under arrest. Gentlemen, when I finish explaining matters to you, you will not only let me go, but you will apologize for interrupting my three-game series. Is that right? I promise you that. Yeah, well, we know what that's worth, don't we? 5.45 p.m., we took the suspect downtown and booked him. Bill advised him of his constitutional rights. Now, you're sure you understand your rights? Now, how many times do you intend to ask me that stupid question? As often as it takes to get an answer. I have very patiently explained to you, gentlemen, that I am well aware of my rights to counsel, to remain silent, etc. I have also tried to make you understand I consider those rights safeguards for criminals, not for innocent men such as myself. I have nothing to fear from the truth. In my particular case, gentlemen, truth is the best defense. Now then, you have questions to ask me. You do have questions to ask me, haven't you? That's right, we do, Loomis. That's Mr. Loomis, Sergeant. Considering the extent to which I'm willing to go to be cooperative, I don't think a little respect, a little common courtesy is too much to expect from a public servant. All right, you, now let's go way back. You want to explain? You try explaining why you copped your mother's funeral money. My mother's funeral money. It does sound a bit callous, doesn't it? Just a little around the edges. Well, things often do until you know all the facts. I took that money because it was the only way I could make certain of getting something out of the estate. Our brother Charlie was mother's pet, and I had reason to suspect she had written me out of the will. I wasn't guessing, gentlemen. She told me a week before she died that she had written me out. What would you have done? I can assure you that my mother's passing over to the other side brought my dear brother far more than the $950 I managed to salvage. You want to tell us about a Mrs. Loomis in Penley, Ohio? Oh, sweet girl. I only left her because she became pregnant. Wasn't in our plans. In your plans. 
Oh, I couldn't afford it. She would have had to stop working. And I simply wasn't up to that sort of financial responsibility. Officer Gannon, I sympathize with your displeasure. And I don't claim to be a saint, but then a saint doesn't have to worry about trying to support a family he can't afford, does he? I suppose you have an excuse for forgery. You can choose to call it an excuse if you wish. I'd prefer to say I had my reasons. Such as? A combination. One, I am cursed with a taste. Make that an appetite for the finer things in life. I enjoy French cuisine, and I dare boast that I can read a wine list the way most people read the alphabet. Unfortunately, I haven't the knack for earning great sums of money. You know, it's a misery of this century that so few of the people who have the fortunes have the taste and genius to know how to appreciate the things money can buy. I don't deny I passed bad checks, but in my defense, I had the very best of reasons. I can assure you none of those ill-gotten dollars were wasted on the necessities of life. They were spent only on the luxuries. Why'd you marry a second time without getting a divorce from your first wife? Divorce is the business of lawyers. It's an expensive nuisance to the rest of us. See, Janice was terribly anxious to get married. Now I ask you, if marrying me could make Janice happy, and getting a divorce could only make Maxine unhappy, could I take a more honorable course than the one I took? What about Doris Tucker? Oh, I still plan to marry Doris Tucker. As a matter of fact, we have a date tonight, and I can still make it if you haven't too many more questions. What about the honeymoon fund? Uh, what about it? You didn't plan to put it in your pocket? Oh, I didn't say that. I said I intended to marry Doris Tucker. I don't plan to grow old with her. You saw her, a terribly dull, unattractive girl. Sweet in her way, but hardly anyone's romantic daydream. It would make her happy to marry me and go through life known as Doris Loomis, the woman whose husband once disappeared, rather than Doris Tucker, the girl who wasn't even asked. Now, for that favor, and for having dated her these past couple of months, I don't think the honeymoon fund is an unreasonable compensation. All right, Loomis, I have just one more question for you. Well, I think I can guess what it is, but you ask it. This morning, a blind old lady had her house cleaned out. Now, would you know anything about that? Obviously, I did it. Again, to the undiscerning, a clear-cut case of arch villainy. I called up a moving van, told her my old aunt had passed on, and the family had decided to put her things in storage. They did a good, fast job. Of course, there wasn't that much. It's a small house. I sat with Granny in the backyard. Now, they finished that job in less than an hour. I do admire efficiency. What did you plan to do with their things? Pawn some, sell the rest at auction. Why'd you do it? Well, I need the money. Besides, she's a nasty old woman, foul-mouthed and ugly. Anywhere children would see to it that she didn't starve, she'd have a place to sleep. What more does the old crone need? That serves him right. It serves who right and for what? It serves them all right for asking Mr. Daniel Loomis to waste his time babysitting with the old witch. One last question. Yes. What's this thing you have about being called Mr.? This thing, as you put it, is simple enough to explain. When I was in the Navy, I was an ordinary seaman. And it galled me that I had to call illiterates who weren't worth a fraction of my value Mr. Simply because they had the connections and family influence to become officers. Well, I made a vow then and there that in civilian life, I would always be called Mr. Well, now it's going to be a little rough on you from here on in, isn't it? How's that, Friday? Well, where you're headed, there aren't any misters. That's so? Just numbers. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 19th, trial was held in Department 183, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of one count of burglary in the second degree, two counts of forgery, and one count of bigamy.